Hi there. My name is Nicole D'Andrea, and I'm the Assistant Director of Annual Giving and Membership at NYU Libraries. As you've heard, this event will be recorded for the library's archives. You will have to press continue to approve this. Anyone who is RSVP'd will receive the recording link for the event in the coming days. Thank you for joining us today. This Getting to Know series is part of our virtual event series to showcase the incredible work our colleagues are doing each day. We seek to educate and engage while we are social distancing. We have more events coming up and I encourage you to attend them. You may find out about our upcoming events at the library's Eventbrite page. A few Zoom housekeeping items. You have been muted upon entering this event. This is to alleviate background noise during the presentation. You will be able to ask questions at the end of the presentation. You may type them into the chat box or use the raise hand feature at the end and we will unmute you so you can ask it orally. If you're unsure where to find the raise hand feature, click on the icon labeled participants along the bottom of your screen. And at the bottom of the window on the right hand side, you can click the button labeled raise hand and your digital hand will be raised and we'll call on you at the end of the presentation. Um, if you can please turn off your video, it helps for a better connection for everyone. If you would like to use speaker view where only the person speaking is up on your screen, you may enable that option on the top right hand corner of your Zoom screen. Live closed captioning is available for this event and you can enable that at the bottom of your screen by pressing the closed caption slash CC button and select the show subtitle option. The captions will display in the center of the lower part of your screen. We will be showing a presentation during this talk so you can expect that screen share to come automatically. I'd like to now introduce our speakers for today. Janet Bundy is our university archivist at NYU Libraries. Stephen Fullwood is the project director at the Center for Black Visual Culture at NYU's Institute of African American Affairs. Alexandra Provo is the metadata library at NYU Libraries. Metadata librarian at NYU Libraries. Jasmine Sykes Kunk is a reference associate in NYU Special Collections. They will all be in conversation about this exciting project of archiving the Soul of Reason radio program. Jasmine will be starting us off. Thank you, Jasmine. Thank you so much, Nicole, and thank you to Liz and everyone who organizes this series. We're really excited to be presenting tonight. Um, so I would like to talk to everyone about NYU Special Collections, in which I am a reference associate. NYU Special Collections is located on the second floor of the Bopes Library on Washington Square in New York City. Special Collections is a relatively new department at NYU Libraries, having been formed in the fall of 2019, when our reading room, gallery, and classrooms, as you can see, that's a picture of our newly renovated reading room, opened. It's comprised of three historic repositories at NYU, the uh, New York University Archives, the Fales Library and Special Collections, and the Tamament Library and Robert F. Wagner Labor Archives. The University Archives is the institutional repository that holds the history and records for the university. It also documents NYU students and community life, as well as the faculty and alumni. Our Fales has both rare books and manuscript correct collections. It's known for our late 20th century art and culture collections centered in downtown New York, such as the downtown collection, as well as the Marion Nestle Food Studies collection, and the Riot Girl collection is one of the more popular ones. Lastly, the Tamament collections include materials about the history of labor, radicalism, and progressive social movements. One of the notable collections we have is also the Communist Party Papers. Um, one of the many great opportunities about now being a newly merged department is that our, there are so many overlaps between all three repositories and now they can be viewed and studied and researched in one beautiful space. Uh, the NYU Special Collections Reading Room is normally open to the public. However, due to the cover current government mandates and our ongoing renovation schedule, the reading room is currently closed to researchers. Uh, please check our website, which is linked in the chat, um, for more updates in regards to the services we'll be able to offer during the NYU return. Um, hopefully in the fall, we'll be able to do some uh, remote reference, but we will keep you posted. And um, now we'd like to turn to Stephen, who can speak a little bit more about the history of IAAA and Soul of Reason. Thank you, Jasmine. Good afternoon. Thank you so much for coming to and joining us today. My name, again, my name is Stephen. I want to offer you some context for the Solar Reason Community Project. 
I want to start by sharing some basic information about the Institute of African American Affairs, the Center for Black Visual Culture, Dr. Roscoe Brown, and of course, the Solar Reason Radio Show. The Institute of African American Affairs and the Center for Black Visual Culture at New York University are both interdisciplinary spaces where students, faculty, postdoc fellows, artists, scholars, and you, the general public. Founded in 1969, IAAA's mission continues to research, document, and celebrate culture and intellectual production of Africa and its diaspora in the Atlantic world and beyond. IAAA has a strong commitment to the study of Blacks and modernity through the concentrations in Black Africanism and Black urban studies. The CBVC expanding on that mission is a space for scholarly and artistic inquiry, framing and reframing into the understanding and exploration of images, focusing on Black people globally with critical evaluations of images in multiple realms of culture, including how various archives and the development of visual technologies affect the constitution and construction of representations. The goals of IAAA and CBVC converge to promote and encourage collaborative research projects, experimental learning, and open spaces to the larger community for broad and thematic discussions through various diverse and dynamic public programming and initiatives by the way of conferences, lectures, workshops, screenings, exhibitions, readings, I think I said readings twice, performances, uh, visiting scholars, artists, residencies, and publications. Now for over 50 years, the Institute and now the Center, founded in 2008 by scholar, photographer, and director, Dr. Deborah Willis, has functioned as a repository for thought and action. I am so thrilled to be a part of this Institute and Center. It's this kind of work that changes lives. Please visit our webpage at nyuiaa.org to find out more about our past and future programming. Next slide, please. Allow me to introduce the incomparable Dr. Roscoe C. Brown, Jr., the founding director of the then named Institute of Afro-American Affairs, and he served in that position for eight years before leaving to become president of Bronx Community College in 1977. Among his many activities as director of IAAA, Dr. Brown hosted Soul of Reason, a popular radio show produced by the Institute and WNYC from 1971 to 1986. And this radio show is the main reason why we are here today. And I'll share a little bit more about that um, radio show in just a moment. Uh, Dr. Brown attended New York University where he earned his master's degree in 1949 and his PhD in education in 1951. And he became a professor at New York University for 27 years. Prior to his tenure at NYU and IAAA, Dr. Brown had a distinguished military career as a famed Tuskegee Airman. Dr. Brown was the former commander of the famous 332nd Fighter Group, celebrated African-American pilots who fought during World War II. The group's 100 squadron flew the P-51 Mustang painted with red tails. You might remember the feature film Red Tails, starring Terrence Howard and Cuba Gooding Jr. The film is about the Tuskegee Airmen, and although the characters in the film are fictional, they are based in, about the, on, the, on the experiences of actual Tuskegee Airmen. Dr. Brown reportedly flew 68 combat missions by the war's end. And for his military service, he was awarded the Distinguished Flying Cross, the Air Medal with eight Oak Leaf Clusters, and the Presidential Unit Co Citation. In, in 2007, uh, 2007, excuse me, Dr. Brown was one of the 200 last surviving Tuskegee Airmen collectively awarded the Congressional Gold Award Medal, the highest civilian award by former President George W. Bush, at the U.S. Capitol Rotunda. Next pl slide, please. Now let me tell you about the Solar Reason radio show and why the Solar Reason matters. Again, the Solar Reason was a half hour radio show that aired from 1971 to 1986. And it was a collaboration between IAAA and the commercial radio station WNYC and later broadcast on New York University station WNYU. The show's mission was to be a showcase for Black scholarship, to examine the foundations of African-American thought from a variety of areas. Interviewees included politicians, medical professionals, educators, professional athletes, writers, performers, and contemporary visual artists who discussed these issues affecting Black and Puerto Rican communities and economically deprived neighborhoods of New York City. 
Dr. Brown focused on building a platform for those professionals and artists who spoke directly to students, faculty, staff, and community members. This gave the show an intimacy and warmth. Brown's style was informal. His easy back and forth dialogue with a variety of professionals, mainly from the New York City area, they spoke uniquely to the challenges of being Black and having a Black experience in, in New York City. Some of the subjects included the American Bicentennial, the creation of the Gateway National Recreation Area, the New York Public Library's 135th Street Branch Library evolved into what we know today as the Schoenberg Center for Research in Black Culture, and the effects of New York City's fiscal crisis on education, employment, healthcare for these communities. These were regularly discussed projects. Repeat guests include the Vice Chairman of the Democratic National Committee, Basil Patterson, President of the New York Urban Coalition, Arthur Barnes, Editor for Sports, Black Sports Magazine, Alan Barron, Editor at Large for Black Enterprise Magazine, Pat Patterson, Authors Nathan Huggins and John O'Killens, and Doctors John Holloman, June Christmas, and Ivory Carr. Pictured in this particular slide are three important figures known locally, nationally, and probably internationally. Starting from the left, we have Mary Lou Williams, pianist and composer, Jean Blackwell Hudson, chief librarian of the Schomburg Center for Research and Culture, and Douglas Turner Ward, Black playwright and co-founder of the Negro Ensemble Company, the most successful Black theater company to date. These audio, ta audio tapes provide listeners with varied interest, a sense of what it meant to be Black or Puerto Rican during the 70s into the mid 80s. Remarkably, and remarkable in their range and substance, the 266 conversations are unique and in some cases rare exploration into the post-civil rights moment, Black power in the Black arts movement, as well as civil unrest in different parts of the city. Please consider collaborating with us this week or in the future on this project. No doubt you will enjoy yourself and maybe learn something that you didn't know. Thank you very much. And now I'm gonna turn it over to my colleague, Janet. Thank you, Stephen, for providing that um, essential context uh, about the project. Um, I think it's important now to recognize the work of many people within and outside NYU libraries who have worked over the years to make this collection visible, audible, and accessible. We are indebted to each of them. Many of those people are part of our broader project team. You can see their names on the main page of our project website, which we'll share a link to now in the chat. First and foremost, we are grateful to everyone at the Institute for African American Affairs who donated their records to the archives in 1994. Their recognition of the value of the Institute's work, the trust placed in the archives, and the possibilities for teaching and learning that their records opened up lie at the core of this project. Over a decade later, a graduate student, Tanisha Jones, who I believe was able to join us this evening, wrote her master's thesis in NYU's Moving Image Archive program on the Soul of Reason recordings. Jones, who is now director of the Moving Image Archive, Jerome Robbins Dance Division at the New York Public Library for the Performing Arts, advocated through her research for the preservation of this collection. After interviewing archivists across the country to locate similar collections, and after speaking with Dr. Brown about the origins and evolution of the show, she wrote, these findings show that the soul of reason represents rare and valuable historical documentation, which underscores what Stephen just shared with you. The rest of this slide marks additional steps that NYU libraries took toward making this collection more accessible. In 2010, I collaborated with colleagues from the Barbara Goldsmith Preservation and Conservation Department at NYU Libraries to prepare more than 200 of the Soul of Reason recordings for digitization using funding awarded to NYU by New York State. Five years later, the remaining recordings were digitized in-house by that department. In 2018, colleagues in the Archival Collections Management Department prepared item-level descriptions of each recording and colleagues in the Digital Library Technology Services Department prepared the files for streaming access through the finding aid, which you can see as a tiny picture here um, and to which Nicole will um, share a link in the chat. All of these people and their care for the collection enabled our project today. I'm going to let my colleague Alex speak further about the grant funding we've received for the project. Thank you, Janet. Um, next slide, thank you, great. Um, so we've been fortunate to receive internal funding from NYU 
uh, to work with the Soul of Reason material. So one grant that we've received is a Digital Humanities Seed Grant from the NYU Center for the Humanities. This grant is intended to fund the initial development of new research projects that will analyze digital sources, uh, apply algorithmic methods to humanities data, or create digital publications, exhibits, or websites. The key focus of this grant will be to move beyond the important digitization and preservation work we have done to begin working collaboratively with researchers to shape your use of the Soul of Reason collection as data. By holding events like this one, we hope to connect with interested researchers, collaboratively create and curate data, and jointly develop your research questions and methods. We'll also be supporting a graduate student digital humanities project using this material, which I'll talk about later in the presentation. And I just wanna give a shout out. Our approach here is really inspired by similar projects funded by the Collections as Data Initiative. And Nicole will um, send a link there in the chat. Next slide, please. So we've also received support from the NYU Center for Data Science through their DS3 program. DS3 aims to enhance the research capacity of NYU by providing highly skilled labor for funded projects and increasing the competitiveness of grant proposals. Thanks to funding and guidance from the DS3 group, data scientist Nyla Ennels will be working with us to experiment with tools and workflows for applying natural language processing, named entity recognition and or topic modeling to the transcripts. She'll come up with and document workflows and train us as a team. Uh, now I'll turn it over to Janet for the next slide. Thank you, Alex. Um, and now we come to the part of the presentation where we really um, want to recognize that some of you have already agreed to be part of our um, transcribathon, which is happening this week, and also invite others to join us if you're interested. Um, the first set of events that we have planned will allow you to engage personally with the Soul of Reason recordings and participate in making them more broadly available. And as Alex just noted, in enabling different kinds of scholarship. These are our transcription events, which begin tomorrow afternoon at 2 p.m. Um, this will be an experiment. We will be opening up the system that we use to edit transcriptions of audio and moving image recordings to volunteers who will help us correct and make more understandable auto-generated or computer-generated transcripts of recordings in the Soul of Reason collection. What does that mean? Participants will create accounts in a system called CONCH, which, NYU's, which NYU library staff use to create and correct transcripts of audio and moving image recordings held by NYU Special Collections. Participants will be assigned a recording from the collection and given a computer-generated transcript to edit. Documentation of how to use CONCH, as well as our local practices for editing transcripts for this collection, can be found on our project website, which we'll share through the chat. As I mentioned, our virtual transcription events begin tomorrow and extend through Saturday of this week. The events will take place between 2 and 4 p.m. They'll include a brief training session at the beginning over Zoom, as so much of life seems to be these days, and will give us the opportunity to co-work on editing individual transcriptions it will allow participants the chance to reach out to project team members if you need assistance or hit any hurdles. We also hope that each session will give participants a chance to share what they've learned while engaging in the kind of deep listening to these recordings that's required to do this kind of editing work. And it's really that last part, the opportunity for people to come together and to listen to and learn from the voices in the collection and each other that most excites me about our community events. Alex is gonna describe what we have in store for the academic year. Take it away. Great, thank you, Janet. Um, so next slide, please. Okay, awesome. So in addition to these transcription events, um, at a future event, we will provide training and a venue for collaboratively creating a structured data set about the people, organizations, social initiatives, and important works discussed in the recordings. Wikidata is a structured data counterpart to narrative Wikipedia, which many of you may already be familiar with. We'll be hosting edit-a-thons to contribute to Wikidata, where you can add new information or, or enrich existing information 
about the people, organizations, works, and topics mentioned in The Soul of Reason, as well as link that information to the recordings and transcripts in the collection. Next slide, please. We hope that the work that we do together to improve the transcripts and to create structured data through edit-a-thons, as well as our data science work, then inspires researchers to do cool projects with the soul of reason. As part of our DHC grant, we've built in funding for an NYU graduate student to do just that. The student will be advised on content, tools, and techniques by project team members from both the IAAA and the Division of Libraries including digital scholarship services. One example of an activated audio archive project that we're inspired by and that could serve as a model is the Black Lunch Table Audio Archive, which is a topical network visualization and access tool for recordings of a series of roundtable discussions. And we'll share the link there in the chat if you're interested in checking out that awesome project. Um, additionally, the student will have the opportunity to blog about their work on the NYU Special Collections blog. And stay tuned, that's coming up um, in this next academic year, and we are excited. Um, so now I'll turn it over to Jasmine. Thanks, Alex. Um, so on behalf of everybody today, we just wanted to say thank you again for listening. Um, we just wanted to reiterate that this is all for you and we are so excited to see um, what new things can come out of it. So it's your feedback, your interest, uh, your queries, um, and we are so excited for the next steps. As a person who is a black woman and new to the archival and special collections field, it gives me so much joy to be able to, to amplify these collections that we have and to bring in people from both the academic and the, the greater community so that they can can celebrate and revel in the history and make beautiful new things. So if here's our contact information on the slide and we are excited for the next steps, please join us for the transcripts, uh, transcribe-a-thons in the next coming days. And we look forward to hearing your feedback now. Uh, thank you so much. So if anyone has any questions, um, about the project, about one of the transcribathons, please don't hesitate to ask again by either using that raise hand feature um, in the participants tab or type it in the chat. Thank you. So um, Arlene in the chat asks, sorry if I missed this, how do we listen to Soul of Reason? Um, I can take that one. So we, um, we prepared uh, what's called a finding aid or a guide to the collection of the records of the Institute for African American Affairs, um, of which the Soul of Reason recordings are a portion. Um, and the uh, finding aid has item level or individual recording description of each recording in the soul of reason portion of the collection. It also has a link um, to a streaming audio file that you can click that will bring up a viewer or a, whatever the audio equivalent of a viewer is like another window where you can play the file back um, and listen to it on your device, whether it's a telephone, um, computer, what have you. You do not have to be um, an NYU community member to access these recordings. All of our finding aids are um, open and searchable online, but we'll add a link to um, the finding aid in the chat right now. Thank you, Janet. Um, the next question um, is, will some of the transcripts be in Spanish? I have research experience transcribing interviews from Spanish to English. Um, I could I could try to take that one and anyone can feel free from the team to jump in. Um, so I we aren't planning to translate any of the transcripts. Um, so but if there is any audio in Spanish, that would be um, something to to include in the in the transcription and the correction. But in terms of translation, 
Um, that's not on our radar yet, although um, it's an interesting idea. Awesome. Um, the next question um, comes from uh, Krista. How does conch, and then spelling, that's how I would have spelled it, conch, um, if work, if at all, to protect transcripts from being copied by participants and posted elsewhere, or is that a concern? Yeah, um, I can take that one again. Um, so that's a good question that I probably should have asked myself before we started today. Um, but I would say actually, um, at least for me, it's not a huge concern um, because we are hoping to make these transcripts available openly. Um, but uh, yeah, I will definitely look into that and communicate that to, to folks participating uh, in the transcription events. Thank you. Um, another question we got from Patricia is, will you provide specific guidelines on the days of the transcription? This is a question that I had too, because I'm signed up for one. Um, can you kind of walk me through, uh, walk us through sort of the, how it would go? I can take a stab at beginning that and I may um, pass this over to Alex to finish. Um, we will be sending out, so for anyone who has, um, who has RSVP'd for one of the days, again, that's Wednesday through, th through Saturday of this week, we'll be sending an email, hopefully this evening, <laughs> to you, um, inviting you to create an account in Conch and, um, and pointing you to some places on the project website where our documentation, both of using that system, um, and our transcription guidelines are posted. During the actual um, transcription sort of virtual event, we will also provide additional um, training on how to sort of acclimate yourself to that interface. Um, that'll be provided for you then, and we will be available throughout the entire two-hour block. Um, project team members will be available if you have any questions or hit any hurdles technologically, um, et cetera. Um, in terms of the more uh, granular description of how the system works, I'm, I'll defer to Alex on that one. Yeah, I'll just point to, um, we have on our website uh, under the transcription events uh, page, we've got a link to a manual, which is a sort of written guide of um, the conventions we'd like everyone to follow when correcting the transcripts. And one of our colleagues um, recorded a tutorial video, so you can also watch that. Um, and that takes you through kind of the, the details of the interface and shows you live um, how the correction process actually works. Okay, thank you. Um, scrolling through. Um, Somebody's asking about um, access to uh, Tanisha Jones's master's thesis. I know some of the PhDs are online. Um, yeah, I can I can take that one. Um, so this is kind of a just a bigger answer to a very specific question, but I promise I'll circle around to the specific question. Um, the university archives does not systematically um, collect dissertations or theses, although we do on occasion receive um, usually collections of master's level theses from departments. So um, we happen to have a copy of Tanisha's thesis because she shared it with us as she was writing about a collection held um, in the archives. And um, all of this happened before I was part of the department. Um, but I when um, we receive requests to have access to student work, um, typically I would go back to the creator and ask if, um, if that would be all right, if we could make that available. Um, it's certainly something I would love to, um, to discuss with Tanisha, um, whether um, all or part of it might be appropriate, for example, for addition to the website, but that's something that I would um, have a conversation with her about. Thank you. Do you have any other questions? Again, raise hand or pop them in the chat. So 
Somebody just asked, um, George just asked, I'm not able to participate in the session tomorrow. Can I participate in the remaining sessions? And I can take that. Um, I typed it in the chat as well, but everyone can participate on one or as many days as you'd like. Um, I believe and I suspect that it takes a little bit of time to get acclimated to the system and the you may want to work on your transcript for a, an additional day. So if you are able to come for more than one day, we would highly encourage it, but it's not mandatory at all. So if you can't come on Wednesday, if you can only come for one day, um, at the end, we will ask you to let us know where you were. So if you were able to finish it, that's great. If not, someone else will um, continue for you. So any amount of time would be greatly appreciated. Thank yeah. you. Um, and I'll just add on that um, we are going to provide some training during the um, Zoom sessions, but you're also welcome to work on the transcript kind of at your own pace, um, at your own time. It doesn't have to be um, just within the two hours that we can come together on Zoom. If you have more questions, keep them coming. Again, you can use the chat or the raise hand button on the bottom. I'm also gonna relink to signing up for the virtual events. That's at the bottom of the chat. If you wanna just click that, have that open in your browser, you can sign up for one of the transcription events Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, or Saturday. Um, Sean asks, can someone please speak to the societal implications they are envisioning for this collection in the long term? And if you cover this, you sorry. Hi, Shanta, could you um, ask, <clears throat> could you um, clarify societal implications in terms of- Of course um, I can, Stephen. <laughs> I <was> like, Hi, <laughs> I just wanted to talk to Stephen. No, really, I had, I was curious about, I mean, not only the collection, but also the act of transcribing the collection and putting it into the world in this format and in this collectively generated way. What do we think this means, I think it's kind of a new way of approaching archival collections and approaching community interactions with archival collections. So I'm curious if we have an idea of like the, the content itself and its implications in a broader landscape, but then also the activity of having this other layer of community engagement with the content. And if that seems like it'll percolate in a more um, strategic way or in a magical way even. Mm -hmm. Um, I can speak a little bit to that. I think that having both the um, the transcriptions of the tapes, but also the tapes available for public um, research, for research for anyone, this is another way of bringing access to the public, but also working with the public to make this material more accessible. So I think that the, the implications are finding ways to make collections that might sit on shelves for years and years and years to bring them out in unique and um, collective ways. So there's a, collect there's a collective across campus with the Institute and with the libraries, but also with different members of the community, different kinds of members who might have an investment in seeing this material um, out there, you know, for a variety of reasons. And so just think for a moment that we, we know you're an archivist, you understand that sometimes we don't get to collections to process them as much as we'd like to. There's more in the ether right now, there's more of a process a little, but make the collection available. And so this, I see this as a um, springboard to bring people in to see the collection in general, but also to maybe discover new names and new, you know, new moments during this time. And, and just to find out more about people who were doing this work during the 70s and 80s. I think it's, it's awesome and I also feel like it's really it augments or could augment a number of researchers 
who are looking for this kind of material to bring their um, research alive. To talk about Jean Blackwell Hudson or Douglas Turner Ward. And, you know, sometimes I think my guess is that of the 266 um, uh, conversations, there are going to be some where this person, this might be the only thing this person went on record with and everything else is about this person. So it'll be great to see um, and explore that. So I see it, the implications being really um, widespread and useful. I'd also like to add, in addition to what Stephen is saying, all of those things, yes and more. But I feel as though, as a native New Yorker and being born and raised in Brooklyn and knowing about um, the existence of shows like this and seeing the names of community members, um, as Stephen mentioned, Douglas, Turner Ward in the Day of Absence, you know, and Black Solidarity Day was something that I celebrated as a kid. And so seeing the intersections, Dr. Joan Maynard, I'm from Bed-Stuy in Weeksville, you know, is is on that. And she's talking about her work and, and how it spreads out. And what I really enjoy and what I'm excited about, which is also what's really cool about Special Collections now, is that there's so many overlap in people, in stories, in their work, in, in society. and just in this, preparing for this and listening to some of the collections, hearing the connections and, and seeing, oh, wow, I didn't even know this about this person. And if it's already bringing this insight, like I can only imagine with the linked data components, if somebody is starting to do research and they are you know, looking at keywords and they're completely somewhere else, if they're on Wikipedia and it draws them into this collection and they get to expand and see this wealth of information. And I think a lot of people look to places like the Schomburg, you know, they look at the, um, the Black, Sonian, the National Museum of African American History and Culture in DC as the as the central and only kind of locations of black history and culture where however like we're everywhere and you can find our stories embedded in lots of different places and sometimes those aren't readily available or visible when people come in. So if this is another way to bring people in and to see what we have and to use what we have in new ways, um, I'm super excited to see um, how that comes together. Well said, well said. Yes, um, yeah, and thank you, yeah, thank you both for sharing that. Um, and thank you, Sean, for, for this really great question. Um, I just wanna add a few things about, um, you know, the technologies that we're using. And I think I'm really hopeful as well that, um, that uh, I kind of, I think I said with the Wikidata, oh, we'll just put stuff in there, but it's actually not such a simple thing. And that's, um, I really want to have that conversation with people. What does it mean to put this information in a place like Wikidata or Wikipedia? Um, and I think as well with um, transcription, uh, when we make corrections or when we uh, add structured data, those are all choices that we're making about how we describe the material. So there's a real, I hope, um, great opportunity for critical reflection on our systems. Um, and kind of the standards and the, the way that we describe things. So that's something I'm excited about, about this project as well. I, I have something only very brief to add because I can't imagine improving on what my colleagues have already said. I do think that going back to the materials themselves, there's a particular opportunity here um, because these are audio recordings um, and there's a way to um, as Stephen was saying earlier, it, it is kind of an, an intimate sort of document um, to listen, to literally listen to voices. Um, and I think doing so in service of um, promoting a collection, creating greater awareness, thinking about um, description and how, um, how that should be constructed or can be constructed is, um, is a really interesting kind of window into um, opening up the opportunity to describe archival materials beyond people who work in a library. Um, but I think the format in this case is actually really, um, really kind of interesting. Thank you, everybody. Okay, last call for questions. Um, again, use the raise hand, type them in the chat. Can I add one follow up? And it's not even a question. Of course. Thank you for your answers. I also wanted to put into the mix this challenge that I've come to with archiving communities, which is in the age that we're in, where we are in archiving, where we are in Black 
history and where we are in queer history and where we are in like community histories, right? Where we're sort of looking at the 60s from a point of people's, the end of people's lives where they're ready to compile that and put it together. I think we all know someone or are someone who has their, their box waiting to be archived, right? Like they're like, I'm, I need you to put this in, in, you know, if you're the archivist, everyone in your family is giving you their stuff and the community is giving you their stuff and everybody's thinking about, well, where does it go? And, and we know the, 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 the scale at which that would require to actually take in everyone's work. And so I'm thinking about how, what I really love about this project in particular is the next four days because what it does is it provides a template for crowdsourcing um, the community to participate and be, be agents in their own archival practice. And I know that it comes to a very like post moment where it's like, well, first we had to do the donor forms and then we had to you know, create the metadata. There were a lot of steps that led to this process, but what I'm really excited about is this point where the community is participant in some portion of the archival process, because I think what it allows for is an understanding of what it takes to do this kind of work. And also it makes them as, as producers of their own narratives, more discerning around what it is they wanna capture and like how they wanna capture it and where they wanna capture it um, and with whom and which, with which institution. So I just wanna applaud your work. And I also see this as a kind of gateway to a, a more um, integrated archival future. So I just had to also put, put that on the table too. Thank you, Sean. Okay, everybody. So, ooh, here's another question right under the wire. Arlene is asking, that's, don't worry, don't worry. Um, no apologies necessary for questions. How will the transcripts be made available for future students and scholars through NYU Special Collections? This is a great question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, so one way would be through the finding aid. So where you currently find the embedded audio files, um, the transcripts can be added and we're hoping to add them as like kind of an additional file in there. Um, but that's something we're hoping to really kind of puzzle through and work out with you, the researchers. Um, if you want that raw transcript um, text file, you know, if you want to do something creative with it, then that's something we want to kind of um, figure out in our project and why we sought out funding um, to be able to build that infrastructure uh, and think up those solutions together so that we can get you um, the collection kind of as data in a way that um, is useful to you. So that's sort of a roundabout, stay tuned, but if you wanna use it, let's talk and um, we wanna figure out how to get it to you. Thank you, thank you, Arlene. I guess I'd just like to to chime in a little bit um, to add that we are we're hopeful that this project can be a model um, for our work in in many ways in certainly the sort of provision of um, uh, of materials to researchers in the formats in which they need them and through the um, avenues in which um, they need them which we're learning now in this time of um, of COVID is has really kind of revealed um, the difficulties in providing researchers with the research content they need from archives, right? Um, but we're also hopeful that we can um, take this sort of community collaborative transcription model um, that Sean so eloquently um, described and use it with other collections that we have um, and work with other institutions if they're interested in the same kind of thing that we're hoping that this, um, this project can be, can be a model in, in kind of multiple ways for our work.
Thank you, Janet. And thank you to everybody for coming. Um, if you um, have any additional questions, please reach out to the team. Please come to the transcribathons. I'm excited for the one tomorrow I'm going to. Um, and um, thank you again for joining us tonight. Have a great rest of your evening.